Okay, thanks for joining us, Harry. Um, I, had a, I had a chance to watch the film last night um, and loved it, actually. It Thank you very much. Very Thanks. intense um, and, and very moving, but surprisingly so. Um, uh, so I've got a, a few questions about different aspects um, of the film. Um, and I wanted to start with, with location. Uh, because it's an obvious question to ask because this was shot just up the road from us. It's a local film, effectively. Um, yeah. Shot and set in, in, on location in the Lake District and, and, and the Dales. Um, and it's a spectacular location, I think, but it probably doesn't appear in films as often as, as one might expect. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to, to ask, what, what, were the, what, the, what were the practical challenges of shooting in Cumbria? And why did you choose that location? Because it's not named... It's not named in the film, I don't think. Uh, well, um, when I was writing the film, I, was, I spent portions of that time up in the Lake District because I've got some family that live up there. Um, and, you know, it, needless to say, it's an infinitely inspiring, beautiful, um, ever-changing place to be uh, and to live. And naturally, the, the environment up there informed the writing um, to, to, to quite a large degree. I think in general terms, I, I, I'm really interested in writing about environment and placing characters out of their natural environments. I think that's really cinematically quite an, and dramatically quite an interesting thing to do. And it certainly it mirrors, you know, how inspired I am when I'm in those landscapes. But, but when you're making a film, of course, you, you never, you never know whether you're going to be able to shoot in those places. You know, I, I, I'd written quite a lot of the scenes quite specifically to sort of, um, I placed them in, in specific, you know, parts of the lakes that I knew, but you never really know whether that's ever going to be possible. And we tried, you know, we looked at some other options, of course, as you always do, but then it just seemed to be such an organic uh, part of the, you know, the whole process that we really wanted to try and shoot in the lakes. And, and, and we did happily, very luckily. Um, but it does, but it is, it is a challenge. Shooting in that environment is a huge challenge, not only for very obvious reasons like weather. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think you, you can't make a British road movie, set it in the autumn and then complain about the weather too much. But forgive me if I complain about the weather a little bit. Um, it was, uh, yeah, it was, it, that was a real challenge for us. Um, it was very, very bad weather for a lot of the shoot. Mm -hmm. So that was, um, that was a challenge. But I think shooting road movies in general is always a challenge to a degree. Yeah. That's the beauty of them. I think it gives you it inherently gives you a kind of freedom um, and, a you know, a, um, there's something kinetic about about shooting road movie, of course, and being constantly moving as a team, I think, is, is really interesting just just in terms of the experience of making the film. But it has its huge challenges. I mean, often we didn't have any. Um, control over the environment, over the roads. We were driving on live roads. Colin was actually driving the van, much right. to the amazement of several people driving past, as you can imagine. And it's and it's difficult up there because the, the roads are narrow. And you know, we were we weren't a huge team, but we were a big enough team for that to be problematic at times. Um, but I think ultimately, it just it really fed into the authenticity of the story we were trying to tell. And that was really the, the crux of it from a creative perspective at all times was trying to make something as authentic as possible and make it in the most authentic way. Yeah. So not, not cheating anything was a big part of the process. Um, so I think it sort of worked, but yeah, it was a, it was a challenge. <laughs> yeah. That's, um, it's interesting that you, you mentioned road movies because you're, your first film was a road movie, Hinterland, as well. Yeah. This is quite a, quite a specialised genre in British cinema. There aren't that many uh, British road movies. I mean, I can think of a, a handful. Um, yeah. Michael Winterbottom's Butterfly Kiss, yeah. Drew Cotting's Galavan, Chris Chris Pettit's Radio On. Oh, yeah. Um, but it, but it's, it's a really it's a really sort of it's a micro genre I think in British cinema. So mm -hmm. could you say a little bit more maybe about the about the road movie? What what interests you about road movies as a as a filmmaker? You mentioned the kinetic quality of them. I think it's well quite a few things really. I, I think very very simply it, it's just for me always about trying to tell stories in an original way. And I think 
there was a version, a very obvious version of this kind of relationship drama mm. that was domestic. That, and I just wasn't interested in making that that kind of film. So actually, that that alone inspired, you know, the 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 thought behind trying to make it in a slightly different way. I love road movies yeah. anyway. Um, and I think it is interesting that we don't make a huge amount of them in this country. There's lots of reasons for that, probably. Yeah. You know, you drive too far and you fall off the end, <laughs> off yeah. the edge. And we don't have the kind of obsession with cars that Americans have. You know, um, I think they, that's one of the reasons why they love road movies and make a lot of them. Um, so originality is partly is partly the, you know, the start of it. Um, so I think there's that. But also, I think the... The idea that you're getting characters out of their comfort zone and you're putting them in an environment in which they don't have any control or not a huge amount of control. I think that's dramatically very interesting, especially when you're, you know, dealing with characters that are, you know, in flux in some way, you know, a transitioning in their lives and in their relationship, um, you know, the central relationship. I think that really it helps to it kind of informs that in a different way it gives the characters a, a a freedom but also you know a constriction which i think is 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 very interesting um in terms of storytelling um so that all of those reasons um and i think also just that yeah just the sense that we we would have a kind of microcosmic you know we'd be investigating uh, in a, a relationship un, under a microscope but then placing it in a much more cinematically bold and uh, hopefully profound landscape, both literal and emotional. I think that's one of the things that road movies really allow you to do, um, you know, very naturally. You don't really have to force that because it's there already uh, on in Inception. So it, all of those reasons w w were kind of built into it, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I think, I mean, I, 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 that's really interesting. I think that there's this fascinating um, paradox in, the in, 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 in all road movies between the sort of, as you say, that microcosmic focus on this, the space, mm -hmm. small space, claustrophobic space that the characters are in, and then these sort of vast spaces that they're moving through. It's a really yeah. um, sort of intrinsically cinematic, actually, because it sort of, it draws our attention to space. Yeah. Um, you were talking about, <clears throat> placing characters outside their comfort zone. You were working with <clears throat> two very experienced actors <coughs> on this film who'd worked on the stage, on TV, big budget films, as well as uh, low budget independent films. Stanley Tucci's worked with Michael Bay, even on sort of so sort of transnational blockbusters. Um, and so I imagine this was sort of, to, to different degrees, this was probably an, an, an interesting experience for them. So could you tell us a little bit about what it was like working with um, uh, star actors as a director um, in this on this project? Well, I mean, I think the first thing to say is that I would just be, you know, forever grateful that they decided that they would be you know, brave enough to get involved in the project, to be perfectly honest, because like you say, you know, Colin and Stanley have been working for a long time. They're enormously successful and enormously famous. And I don't know when the last time either of them made a film like this, by which I mean on this budget, you know, in in these uh, in this environment was. It was a, a really, really long time ago. And to put it bluntly, Colin and Stanley don't need to make a film like this. You know, they, they really don't. I mean, they might disagree with that. But, you know, I think they're... I, I think that alone says a lot about them as people and their trust in me and the and the material i think that was just a, a a really i was really yeah i will forever be grateful that they trusted it all so much um and i think also working working i think it's perhaps it's um it's but maybe a bit dangerous to work with actors of this caliber when you're so new as a director I think there's a version of the film that could have been an absolutely horrendous nightmare. Um, and it really wasn't that, you know, yeah. Colin and Stanley are just so nice. I mean, that's the honest truth. They're brilliant actors, but also they're, lo they're lovely guys. And they were so trusting of me and, and my vision for the film. And it really was a, a, a lovely, you know, challenging, of course, but in, you know, intensely wonderful 
creative <laughs> collaboration. I think they, um, I think Colin and Stanley really choose what they do very carefully. They really do. And I think they spend a lot of time thinking about whether they have the right to inhabit characters um, okay. and tell those stories. And I think that's really important as, a, as an actor and as a, as a human too. And I think they, what they found, what they saw in the script was something that they don't get, get sent very often for a start. And I think they knew that it was hopefully a project that was at least, well, it was at least trying to be more than the sum of its parts. You know, they saw the importance of telling this story as well as the, you know, the, the beauty of the, of the characters that they would be playing. Yeah. You can't really ask for more than that as a, as a writer or a filmmaker. Um, but also I think it extends further than that. You know, I think I, I wanted to make the film because I, I felt that there was a really important story to be told, not only about dementia, but about end of life choices. And especially in the context of the last 18 months, you know, how we look after people that we love. I think that's very important to, to sort of, to focus on that for a while. And when you have actors that famous and that brilliant, at, you know, in your project, it travels you know, the film travels. And I think the, the film has played all over the world. Um, and, and, you know, some of that at least is to, is to do with those guys having said yes to being in it. Yeah. And, um, and so in terms of just the practicalities of directing, um, uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not asking, you know, were they divas? I'm not trying to get some, sort of, I mean, but I'm, just, I'm just interested in the sort of, you know, the, um, the, the process um, for you as a director of working with um, you know, such mm. experienced actors. What, I mean, was it, mm. were they easy to work with? Was it straightforward? To, did, what did they bring to the project? Yeah. Well, I, I think, I mean, I, I trained as an actor myself and I, I yeah. still do act um, when I can. So I think that really helps with something like, well, with everything, but certainly with something like this, because I think there's a, there's a shared, language that I okay. naturally, naturally have with Colin and Stan because I've been a bit to a degree I, I've been there and I've I, I kind of know what it's like to to an extent and I think that that goes both ways so I think that there's a there's a trust there that we had between us right which came from that but I think also you know the the job of a director is to be you know is to be able to adapt your directing style to how actors like to work I think that's really an important part of it which I think is, is is very helpful if you've if you've acted performed yourself and and Colin and Stanley work in slightly different ways and I think it it was they were wholly complementary as you yeah. as you hopefully yeah. will know from the film but but it's um definitely you have to adapt the way you go about your work to to get you know to sort of you know to make that work to the to, to the greatest extent I think I think Colin Colin's a very deep thinker about the about script and character. He likes to do a lot of deep dive um, right. research, and he spends a lot. And we took a, we spent a lot of time, you know, all the you know right up until you know turning the camera on, talking about the script and finding finding little nuances in it. I think Stanley is more the kind of actor that is sort of is happy to sort of keep all of that inside of him and then it, it when the camera turns on you know it, it's it's very reactive and very right. um very 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 in the moment yeah say so that colin isn't but i think there are slightly different ways of going about that um so yeah it, it was it, it, i mean they weren't yeah they, they certainly weren't divas and it was a nice collaboration yeah 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 that i mean that sense of 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 interiority is mm. is really clear in the film. I mean, there's a, there's a lot. I think, especially in the first the first half of the film, there's there's a lot that's unsaid. You know, but you know, there's the, the the first half is all about sort of uh, the sort of the I think the implications of what's being said. We're trying to read that as the yeah. the audience trying to pick up on you know on on what's happening inside these characters. And it's but it's not explicit. It's mm. it's you know, but it's carried by the the looks and the um, and the pauses um, really effectively. So I can see how that that carries over that that approach to performance carries over into the film. Mm. Um, so this is a film about dementia and, and about aging in a, in a broader sense. So 
So could you tell us why you chose to focus on that? Uh, what, and, and also what, what the issues are for a, a filmmaker dealing with, um, dealing with that topic um, in film? Uh, well, I think, I mean, I would say, first of all, that for me, it's a, it's a, it's a love story in which you know, dementia is the context. I think it's right. interesting that the films, you know, not, not wrongly, but I think sometimes it can be, I, I've just never seen it necessarily as a dementia film, which yeah. is because, yeah. you know, there's a sort of sub genre of those. And of course it is to a degree, but um, I think that the, the difficulty that you, well, there are films that have dealt with that particular Ill, illness disease uh, mm. before so I think you have to think about the film in the in the in the context of those films um which as a filmmaker is is interesting in and of yeah. itself yeah. but also I think really what it comes down to is a moral imperative to get to as, as much as you can to get it right yeah. um for the people who are going through this lived experience you know I spent as you might know I spent a, a, a lot of years and still do, um, spending time with people who are living with young onset dementia, families, couples, yeah. people in care. And the film, you know, really organically grew from that. And I think once I'd realized after a few years of working in that sector that there perhaps was hopefully an inspiring, important story to be told, you have to really think carefully about whether you're the right person to tell it and yeah. how you're gonna tell it because it, it, you know it, it's it's about real life and real people and real experiences and yeah. but those can't be just sort of sh shaken off um so i spent a long time working out whether i could do it and then once i thought okay well maybe maybe i am the right person to tell this story at this point i yeah. think i then sort of really focused on how i was going to make it not only an original story within that you know context but um, a story that spoke for those people in whatever way um, I think that's just so important you know I, I think it sort of sounds kind of trite to say it but like I, I really do have always said that you know if had the film been a massive critical and economic flop um, but had still like spoken like eloquently and truthfully to the people that are going through this kind of thing that I've spent a lot of time with then that would have been okay it really right. yeah. and, I, and I think it happily you know has you know has largely been been both which is, yeah. which is obviously you know great news yeah right so so getting it right was the was the sort of priority mm. um I think I mean I think I, that, that I think that that sense of the um that you describe of, of you know that sort of balance between that focus that thematic focus dimension but also on the love story is 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 really evident in the film I mean, that's the, you know, it's a, that's that's context rather than the context for this exploration of the relationship, which is what makes this film so so moving. That sort of, mm, you. Um, you know, because it's a story about the the sort of uh, just the, the small small gestures that 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 um, and the small habits of routines as, yeah. of a couple who've been together for a long time. I mean, that's what makes it so touching. Yeah. I think. Um, the, um, <clears throat> the, so this, this, the two central characters, <clears throat> um, are a novelist, excuse me, <clears throat> hey Fever. Yeah, you and me both, yeah. Um, are a, a novelist and a musician. Um, one's writing a novel, the other's preparing for a recital. Mm. So why did you make artists, uh, the focus of the narrative? Um, it's a film about two artists in a relationship. Well, I think firstly because the, the, the type of dementia that, that I was interested in focusing on, which is called posterior cortical atrophy, um, mm -hmm. PCA, um, is a type of young onset dementia that affects, it really interested me because it taught me a lot about what dementia isn't, um, you know, when I was doing my research. And, and what PCA does, generally speaking, is that it affects your your spatial awareness your reading and writing ability and your your eyesight actually before it affects anything that we would not we would normally assume were dementia yeah. manifestations like memory and and that was fascinating because um I, I well i didn't know about that uh, anything about that it's actually what terry pratchett had 
okay. uh, yeah, which I, I found out late, later on. But but I think what's interesting then, if you're if you're trying to you know write a character that is living with that, I yeah. think it, it makes sense for them dramatically to have their livelihood be taken away from them um, be, because of it. So obviously, Tusk is a writer, and that's you know that's how he's lived his life, and he's made career out of it to whatever degree and it felt you know just of course very na naturally more dramatically poignant if that was being incrementally taken away from him so that that decision happened very early on yeah. um and then of course you know i'm trying to think you you, you want you know you want to match them up as a couple and yeah. i guess they you know they would uh, if, if one of them was a writer perhaps they would have met in certain circles perhaps or, or not but I'm also very interested in music in film and people playing live in film. That's always fascinated me. So it felt like perhaps it was a possibility that we could do, we could have both of those things in the film and to have someone who is also, you know, creative and to a degree successful, although, you know, it's debatable how successful either of them are really, um, I would say, but to have that person give up, what they've tried their entire life to be successful at for the other person yeah. felt, you know, felt like the correct thing to do. I think the film, the film for me really, you know, is, is an ex examination of how you go from being an equal partner in a relationship to a carer, how you go from being a lover to a carer. That absolutely fascinated me when I was doing my research um watching people change their lives for someone else because of this experience I found really inspiring and life-affirming actually like complex and challenging of course but ultimately life-affirming and beautiful um and I guess yeah it just made it, it just all of those things it, it sort of made sense in the end yeah 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 I see and so that yeah that 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 transition from lover to care is also something that's negotiated between the two of them as well. So, yes. it's, so that's part of the battle mm. that's going on in the narrative. Whether whether yeah. whether Tusker is, is is prepared to yeah to, to let Sam do that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the the power balance that that um, how it affects the power balance of a relationship is really really interesting. You know yeah. who who has the highest status in that situation. Yeah. You know, it, that's you know it, that's very interesting because it obviously depends a bit about the power status the power balance before diagnosis but yeah. how it changes is is was very interesting to watch when i was doing my research yeah yeah so that's right so it's a sort of it's an extension of what goes on in relationships all the time or a sort of yeah an exaggeration of that. an exaggeration of it for sure yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um yeah mu music music is important in this film in a sort of in in a in a minor way. I mean, the, from the the opening scene where they're listening to the radio in the in the camper van um, onwards, sort of it, it sort of it, it it sort of reappears as a sort of as a significant motif right through to um, uh, the performance by Colin Firth of Is it an Elgar? Yes, I'll leave them all. Yeah, yeah Elgar. Yeah. Um, did he actually play that? Is he a musician? Yeah, it's really interesting because when when he's signed up to it, very soon after that, I sort of called him up and said, "Look, I just want to talk to you about something because this is a this is really important to me, and it's a bit of a bugbear of mine in film right. when when you know a character, an actor is playing a musician, and then they're asked to perform in the film, yeah. and clearly isn't them doing it, or there's some yeah. kind of you know it it informs how you have to edit it, and I'm what really yeah. wanted to avoid that." Apart from anything else and he completely agreed and said he said to me look you know I, I used to play piano a bit I kind of grade five when I was a kid right. like if we can find something if we can find a piece that suits the film but also is something that maybe I can learn that would be the best of both worlds right. and to his enormous credit we we settled on that I made a list of uh, of pieces and that was one that we thought okay that might be the sweet spot between the two yeah. and he just yeah worked really hard and we got him a little teacher and yeah and he and he learned it he brought a um you know a, a electric piano keyboard up to the lake district and had it in his room and 
Yeah, and then it was it was amazing because that was the final thing that we shot the very final day. Okay, it was the you know we tr we tried to shoot chronologically as much as we yeah. could, which is interesting in and of itself. But so yeah, it was the final thing we shot, and Colin sort of you know we we're in the, the theatre by the lake in Keswick. There's about 150 people in the audience, you know, supporting artists, right. and Colin just came out on stage and played it live, you know, and that's no mean feat to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a nice rendition of it as well. It's a very sensitive yeah. treatment of it, I think. So you shot in you shot in sequence in, in chronological sequence. We try, yeah, as much as you can. We did, yeah. yeah. We, we we tried. I mean, I think you, you you sort of try and do that as much as you can anyway when you're making a film, but almost never can you mm. for all sorts of obvious logistical reasons, etc. But we pretty much did actually in this, with a few exceptions. We shot um, we shot pretty much everything in order up until the final week, and then what yeah. we did was that we we took the van and put it in the we, our our unit base was the the pencil factory in Keswick, the old pencil oh, okay. factory, and we we sort of rolled took the wheels off the van and sort of you know, rolled it in because right. uh, it only just fit, and then Dick, the cinematographer, and his team, we, we sort of rigged. A sort of very makeshift um studio i suppose yeah. and had the van in the middle of this of this warehouse space and we shot the interior night scenes in the van yeah um which obviously allowed us to have control over the environment um which was very useful and then on the final day we had colin just colin um and we did the piano bit but up until that point pretty much everything had been in order yeah That's so okay. it was like it was such a beautiful way of working because not only for the actors but for all of us you know we as a you know a small really um tight team we really went through this emotional experience of the film with the characters you know it it really it, it really felt like we were going on this journey with them from start to finish yeah. and by the time we'd got to the cottage which is of course the end of the you know this sort of final act of the film if you like we really felt like the build, the crescendo up until that point, we knew that we were going to be doing some, you know, making some really powerful, hard, hard hitting, you know, yeah. stuff. And, and it really did feel like that. Yeah. Yeah. Does it, um, just start just on that. Um, when you get to the end of a project like this, are you, what does it feel like? Do you feel a bit sort of bereft? At the end of it, you've come to something that, that, that you know it's an it must be an extremely intense process. Mm. Um, very brief. It happened. I mean, you know, like sort of a, a couple of months. Did this take? Um, uh, five and a half weeks. The shoot was okay. Yeah. Right. So e even less than that. And then you're you know then you then it's over. I mean, it must it must feel. Um, uh, <laughs> What does it feel like coming to the end of the project? That's you know, particularly one that that, that was clearly working as you were mm. working well as it was going on. It, it's really, I mean, I think with all films, you, you know, well, actually, it's not quite true, but you, you with most films, you, you've had a, a you know a nice, stressful, but very nice, very very intimate experience with a lot of people, and you know, it's often said, but you, it is, it does feel like a family. And then you say goodbye to them, perhaps never to see them again. And that is always a bit, um, yeah, you do feel a bit bereft. There's a grieving process, I think, yeah. a little bit. But I really genuinely, with this film, it, it couldn't have felt more like that, really. We weren't a huge team. Everyone involved in the film was there because they loved the project, in all honesty. And we we really did feel like we were creating something that was really important and yeah. thought provoking and it really meant a lot to us all of us so saying goodbye was really difficult and, and also you know with just the the way we were what way we had made the film you know we were all living in this kind of lodge park all of us everyone yeah. single person on the film colin stanley you know everyone yeah. it, you know it, it was quite a kind of unique egalitarian thing we you know we, we were all there we were minding our own business hang, like basically hanging out with each other you know not a, not a pub for miles yeah. and it really did feel like a yeah a, um yeah like a, a family experience yeah yeah so interesting um 
I wanted to ask about <coughs> style. Um, you mentioned, because <coughs> you just mentioned Dick Pope, <coughs> who's a very experienced director of photography. Mm. Um, the film is, is, is really visually subtle, I think, um, in terms of color scheme. As you mm. mentioned it's sort of, you know, you shot it in the autumn. Light and dark becomes a, a sort of an increasingly important motif, I think, as the film develops there's a sense of a sort of stylistic shift um and space is really important as well and you've already talked about this as sort of you know different types of space the the you know the cramped interiors of the of, of the camper van and you know then the sort of the cottages the stone cottages and the landscape itself um so could you say a little bit about the the, the choices around style because you know, because I think it's it's such a stylistically striking film. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot to say, really. I suppose about that. Um, uh, firstly, I think what what I wanted to try and take was both a kind of love story and an elegy, I guess. Mm -hmm. And I think I wanted to make a, a mature, romantic, delicate film. That's kind of you know probably in my nature slightly anyway, to, to, to make a film of that, uh, like that. I think there's a real authority to stillness and yeah. and silence. I think those are things in, in my work that I'm, I'm fa like fascinated by. And, you know, a lot of the filmmakers that have inspired me over the years, you know, do that kind of humanist filmmaking where really the focus is on the focus is on leaving your director or your ego at the door, actually, and just thinking, okay, what what is the most elegant, poetic, uh, and like emotionally striking way of um, portraying this relationship going through what it's going through? And in this instance, that to me meant it meant not moving the camera. It meant being still and quiet and observatory, and, and hopefully, you know, bringing the audience into this little microcosmic world with yeah. these characters as if they were a, a passenger on the back seat. Yeah. I think that was um that was really important to me. Um so there's a there's a kind of maturity in that which I think it which I think is evocative of the maturity of their relationship. Um and so yeah and, and so, so working with you know people, someone like Dick Pope or the production designer Sarah Finley, mm -hmm. like we really we really sort of took that and ran with it. You know, we, we wanted to make something that was, you know, of course it's autumnal. There's a, you know, there's a good reason that it's set when it's set and where it's set, you know, that I suppose the characters are in the autumn of their lives, yeah. you could say. Yeah. There's some, there's a, there's a, ro there's a real deep romance in, in that color palette and that, uh, and that time of year, I think. And that's sort of, we really tried to push that as much as possible. Um, and just be as detailed as we possibly could. You know, there's a real detail in the way that Colin and Stanley perform those characters. It's it's so nuanced, but also, you know, ev you know, hopefully everything is detailed about the film to the tiniest, you know, you know, uh, pixel on the screen almost. You know, the production design was is just so full. Uh, even if you you know you, you don't notice it because it is in a way so full of their lived their history, their lived experience, everything is exactly, you know, hopefully sort of evocative of, of who they are and where they're going and where they've come from. And same with Dick's work, you know, it's so, I think what he does or he's done throughout his career is not only be an incredible cinematographer in terms of landscape and environment, yeah. I mean, you only need to look at Mr. Turner or something yeah. like that, but yeah. also, the, you know, the more urban stuff he's made with Mike Lee, but also portraiture, you know, like it, 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 there's a there's a sort of um, there's a romance, but also like a, a real brutality. I think I hope to the to the way the characters are portrayed in the film. You know, Colin and Stanley, I would say for the first time in their careers, are really embracing their age in the film. They're not hiding behind anything. They're wearing normal clothes. They're you know they're doing normal stuff in the context of their relationship, and the way. The way Dick manages to capture um, performance in its rawest form, mm. you know, if you look at all of, you know, the, his collaboration with Mike Lee, you know, I think you could argue that there might not be a filmmaker alive that has so regularly um, turned out, put out, 
performances as as, as amazing as, as he has from his actors and I think a lot of that is down to Dick actually you know I think you've got to you've got to be in the right place at the right time to get that yeah. and Dick certainly knows how to do that um so yeah and then of course you know sound design as well it's sort of mm -hmm. needs to be natural and subtle but also really textured um so yeah it extends to all of the departments I guess um yeah yeah I think it strikes a, I mean, it, it, I think it really strikes a, a nice balance between, you know, romanticism and, and, uh, and realism effectively. So there's a, there's a, as you say, there's a particularity, a specificity to the spaces and to the performances that, that means it's a, you know, it's not resorting to cliche, cliched imagery or cliched characterization. I think that's, it's really successful in that respect. Thanks very much. Um, I've got one, one last question. So you 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 shot this. Well, I've got a, I've got a few questions, but we could finish with this. Um, you shot this in twenty nineteen, um, so it's a couple of years ago. Um, uh, and I guess you've been busy with post production and then the sort of the the promotion of the film since then. Um, what are you working on for the next project? Um, how are you dealing with the, the grieving process of finishing this? Well, um, it's, I'm trying my best to write something else as we speak. Um, I think one of the things that the knock on effect of the last, you know, 18 months, one of the many, and mm -hmm. of course the, the least important, but si since you ask in the context of the film is that it's, it, it's sort of it, in, the, in the nicest way it's dragged on the film a, a lot longer than it normally would you know it's sort of it's incrementally being released all over the world as people uh, you know as countries un, 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 reopen and that's meant that you know I've, I've had to sort of actually sort of be on duty really a lot longer than I probably would have normally so I've, had, I've not had as much time as I would um, normally have had but I'm trying to write another film at the moment um, so I'm just hoping that someone will pay me to write another film <laughs> feel free by the way uh, if the cinema want to put a collection box at the uh, back of the screen you know that's that's fine by <laughs> me and have a whip round and uh... <laughs> the next project. yeah um one one final question like a broader question if i could just ask this um uh because this 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 also touches on uh the same issue so one of the things that's happened in the last uh at least in the last 12 months, um, is that streaming has become much more common as a means of watching film. That was already happening, but it's been accelerated by the, the pandemic. Um, so just, just, just this, and this is just a broad question, what do you think the, as a filmmaker, what do you think the implications of this are for cinema? A, a move perhaps away from the cinema as the principal venue that we watch films in? I think it's un, un, you know, it's undoubtable that the the implications are quite huge. I think, um, I think that like with any, you know, technological um, revelation, there's a lot of pluses and a lot of minuses with it. I think at the moment, what is lovely is that people who love films who might not feel comfortable leaving their houses to watch films are able to do so at home I think that's really important and I think that's a really great thing um for, for me the the theatrical experience the cinematic experience is absolutely everything um and I, I I think a lot of filmmakers feel the same way but for me personally I I just I have I think there's so much value in the collective experience mm -hmm. and I think the, the more we can, as a society, have those collective communal in-person experiences, the better. And I think, I think that's, that extends throughout, you know, society. I think, I think one of the things, the dangers is that, you know, we can sort of become a bit insular and, and I don't think that's a good thing just in general terms. But also I think if you're making films like I, I hope to make films that are important in quote unquote, and you know, are, you know, in which the, the viewer is an active participant in the experience of watching the film. And it's asking you, the film is asking you to think about things about being a human and 
whatever. Um, I think you can you can only really, um, well, that's not quite true. I'll rephrase that. I think that you, you're much more likely to find that experience if you're in a room full of strangers. You know, I think I think just think that alone is so valuable um, that I I really hope that um, you know people support cinemas, independent cinemas, or otherwise, because I think if if we start to lose that, it will be culturally. I think it's a, a massive issue. Um, so yeah, I think pluses and minuses, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I think that's a really good place to finish. A defence of cinema as a, yeah. as a place in which we can encounter strangers yeah. and, and have a collective experience. Yeah, I think that's um, one of the most valuable things we can do with our time, actually. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much indeed.